Welcome to the program. I recently had the good fortune to catch up with an old friend and colleague, Andrew Ledley. And I think all we have to do is press play and take it away. Andrew, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much, Liam. How are you? It's good to see you again. Absolutely great to see you. So I wonder if you could tell our audience a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, where you where you come from, and maybe talk about your childhood a little bit and where you went to school and and all that okay. kind of good stuff. Yeah, sure. So I was I was um, Brought up in a small village called Rosedale Abbey in the middle of the North Yorkshire Moors, which is a, a national park in, in Yorkshire, of course, in, in the northern part of England. Um, my father was a, a, a farmer, a hill farmer a, a, you know, in Rosedale, uh, mainly sheep and cattle. Uh, my life revolved around farming for quite a, quite a number of years. Certainly as a child, I was a typical farmer's son working on the farm. Um, helping out where I could, being a pain where I wasn't helping. Um, brother and a sister both more or less did the same thing. Um, we, we grew up, um, father unfortunately died when we were all relatively young and we finished with the farm, um, moved on. I stayed involved in agriculture, uh, generally speaking. I worked in a, around Castle Howard, which is a stately home in the north of England on the, the estate and tenant farmers uh, in that area. And then eventually went to, to work um, for a, a local uh, agricultural cooperative, a farmer-owned cooperative. It was called BATA, still in, still in existence, good old BATA. Um, worked there for 10 years or so, uh, working first as a, as a rep, traveling around the farms. And then I was a, a grain trader for my sins. Um, and, uh, and then eventually got into the, the garden industry. Um, Came, came to a company called William Sinclair's, which doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. I was responsible for their export sales from the split into two divisions was William Sinclair's pets and horticulture. Uh, I did the, the export sales from the pet division for a couple of years and then for a year or so, well, more than a couple of years, actually. Um, and then for a, a bit more than a year, I worked for the horticulture division, um, exporting into Europe and, and really Sinclair's exported all over the world. It was an interesting experience and a, an introduction to the garden market. Um, we did a lot of work in the Middle East um, just around the time of the Gulf War, of course, with 2002, 2003. Um, Sinclair's kind of lost their way with the export. Um, and, uh, and more or less that was as the internet was coming to the fore. Uh, and the, the idea of internet retail wasn't new, but it was still it was still pretty cutting edge. Um, so I decided to have a go with my own business, which is I set up at the beginning of uh, 2003. The business is called Goodrum Classics, um, and it's an internet retailer specialising in garden and outdoor living products. Um, currently trading from three trading websites. One's called Garden Chic. Uh, one's simply Log Cabins, and the other one is Living Chic. Living Chic is a relatively new site. Uh, just in its infancy, uh, it's still got about 13,000 products on, uh, but it's one that we've more or less uh, parked and, and just allowing it to find its own search engine positioning for a year or so. Garden Chic uh, and Simply Log are the, are the main parts of the business. Um, now based in, in Newark, um, office here with, uh, just have a count, about 14 seats at the moment. There's I think, eight or nine of us. Um, work in the office. It's uh, obviously it's the evening, so that I'm just here by myself at the moment. Um, and that's that's where we are. Uh, it's, it's Goodrum has been on the go since 2002 and progressively grown to a. It's still a relatively small business, but a very very good little business, very sound little business. Um, and here we are. So um, you took your sort of experience uh, in farming and uh, uh, you still must have a love of the outdoors. And now with the uh, Gudrum Classics, 
you uh, uh, are selling like log cabins, right? For yeah, yeah, correct. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Um, I, I, I took my experience from farming, um, which it's been a series of of uh, kind of natural steps, which all put together result in a fairly unnatural result, um, and that is that I started out on a farm, and that progressed to repping to farms and that progressed to trading farm commodities uh, and that progressed to the garden industry. The garden industry um, was supplying retail and then retail progressed to internet retail and and so on. Um, and and uh, yeah, uh, love of outdoors. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got a love of, love of the outdoors. Um, we now import log cabins mainly from Estonia, but from really all over Europe. Uh, into the UK, they come into a, a warehouse that we've got in Northampton, and then we we sell them through mainly through the website Simply Log Cabins, uh, and then they're distributed every set. We cover every postcode area in the UK every seven days, delivering log cabins. Postcodes do you, sh it. Do, do, you ship, do you ship to America? Uh, we don't. Although it's the, the, there are some conversations happening at the moment about both potentially shipping from Canada and also looking at the, the US market. Um, we went to the, there's a, an exhibition in Las Vegas called the National Hardware Exhibition. We went to that uh, last year uh, with a view to kind of understanding the market. Um, America, of course, is a, is a very different proposition to Europe in the sense that obviously that, that geographically it's much bigger. Um, the and the, ge the the kind of geographic spread, the climate spread is is uh, probably greater than Europe. You know, it's south southwest with the Mojave Desert and the whole desert area of the southwest, right up to the northeast, which is probably fairly European in terms of weather. Um, and timber products are maybe not appropriate in the whole of the U.S., but I think there is certainly a market for timber products in part of the U.S. Um. Do you have uh, with your log cabins? Do you have um, any? Uh, you know how how green are they? Do they have solar panels, or are they, uh, or are they just very simple uh, structures that that you can that you can add on to? They they are um, simple structures. There are options to add solar panels. Uh, the timber, of course, is. The, the, the material that's used in virtually all of the log cabins is North European spruce, which on the whole is a farmed crop. Um, so um, up until the, the crisis in Ukraine, most of the timber came from Russia. Um, the Russians tend to get a lot of bad press, but they are good at managing their forestry. Um, and uh, uh, but now since since um, since I was 20 21, something like that. Uh, most of the timber is, is back into Scandinavia. It's still very slowly grown North European spruce. The thing that governs quality of timber uh, is how quickly it grows. And the quick thing that governs that is the climate that it grows in. So the colder the climate, the tighter the growth rings are on the timber, and it makes a, a much denser material. Uh, and that means it machines a lot better. The corner joints work a lot better. Um, but because it's a farmed crop, uh, it's a it's a relatively slow cycle, but nevertheless, it is a farmed crop and is is you know pretty hundred percent sustainable because of that. Um, there's not there, there isn't any hardwood. There's no none of the um, you know, southern Asian teaks or anything like that go into into um, most garden timber products anymore. So when you say log cabins, these are proper log cabins. They're not synthetic or plastic. They're real wood farm. They are, they, they are real wood. Um, they, 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 they're a little different from a, a de the definition that you, you might know in, in, the, in the U.S. in the sense kind of round logs uh, that form uh, residential houses. These are mostly flat logs, and the thing that defines it as a log cabin as opposed to any other garden building is how the corner joints work. They are interlocking corner joints. So there's no screws or nails used in the construction of the walls. So typically, the thickness of the walls would be 44 mil, which is about one and three quarter inches, 
up to about 70 mil, which is 75 mil is about three inches. So it's a little less than three inches. Um, and the, the uses that they're put to are really on the whole, like an extension to the living area in some way. So they're like um, very typically a garden office or a home gym, um, maybe a recreation room, a children's room. Um, lots of lots of uh, typically we do quite a few for people learning to play musical instruments, um, you know, or him or her escape room down the garden. There's really lots of uses. Um, including some for storage, uh, but generally speaking, uh, the, the, the very good quality for storage. It's a, it's a little like converting part of your kitchen into a garden shed to make one of these into storage. They're, they're very good looking, very each, you know, you have many different models, many different styles uh, to the log cabins. And uh, let's say I'm excited, I want to get one. And how does it arrive is it like a huge IKEA flat pack? Does it come in different sections, or how does how do we receive one of one of these uh, log cabins? Sure, it, it it arrives in a in a consignment, typically six meters long, one point two meters wide, and say depending on the cabin, seventy centimeters deep. All shrink wrapped in white plastic. It's timber by timber, so it is it is quite a large, generally speaking, DIY kit. Um, on the whole, there are not so many different components within the kit. It's the same component that's repeated because obviously a back wall that doesn't have any windows, that, that you go round and round the building in a spiral fashion, stacking them, stacking them up. And on the back wall, there may be, there may be 20, 20 planks, uh, and all of them are identical. Uh, and the same goes at the side of the windows, for example. There might be 15 planks or 20 planks at the side of a door. Uh, and again, all of them are identical. So once you identify the individual component, you simply find the other 19 that goes with that component. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a large IKEA type uh, DIY flat pack. Uh, there are contractors that we can refer customers to actually that will take on the assembly work. Um, most customers do it themselves or do it with local you know, joiner help or something like that. Very interesting. And, um, also on your uh, LinkedIn profile, you have um, uh, a few paragraphs about uh, uh, private investing in mergers and acquisitions. Uh, uh, do you still uh, look? Are you still working in the, in that field? Yeah, uh, it's always been a it's always been an interest for me as as M and A. Um, there's nothing that there's nothing that I'm actually actively active in at the moment. Um, the um, the future of Goodrum is something that we're, we're looking at all the time, um, either with a view to to doing something with Goodrum or potentially making an acquisition around Goodrum in some way. Um, so it's something that that I'm always interested in. Uh, I've had experience of it um, really. For years now, on and off in different ways. In the Sinclair days, uh, when I used to do, did, did the export sales, Sinclair's were uh, it, the group was called William Sinclair Holdings. Uh, they bought various companies, and I had mostly operational experience with the integration of the various companies that they bought during the period I was there. Um, and since then, um, NDA prohibits me from being too specific, of course. But I've had a, a couple of uh, of uh, really quite good experiences. Uh, in one case of a of a large retailer, or relatively large anyway, sixty five million pound turnover, um, with uh, with a um, warehouse style retail and also an online presence, selling mainly discount products uh, and various other bits and pieces that that have been involved in. And was this also in the garden uh, industry? Um, the the uh, that larger one was in the garden industry. About thirty five percent of its product was was garden product. Um, the rest of it was homewares, um, a little fashion, uh, really anything that that could be sourced for um, for, the, for for the, for the general public. It was really governed by uh, prices that we could find material at to you know to find products at to 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 offer to the to the market. And um, do you have a, a certain 
uh, size uh, in terms of revenue uh, that that you like to work with? Uh, like, what range of uh, uh, revenue do you do you like to uh, do you find comfortable? Um, well, it, 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 no, the answer to, the answer really is is probably no. Um, but I think what is important is to identify the nature of the acquisition that you're looking at. Is it distressed? Um, is it some kind of synergy to what you're already doing? Um, is it uh, opening new fields? Um, the the key thing for me is, is to identify potential rather than, uh, than than any particular size. Having said that, um, it would be really difficult to get excited about um, very small companies. Um, you know, where it's an you know, owner-operator, effectively. But as long as there's some kind of management structure in there that can either be augmented by uh, external management or or um, can can be used to to manage other potential acquisitions in that area, then uh, that then it's interesting. Do you have any advice for the owner-operator that that wants to sell? and realizes that they are spending too much time in the business and they have to diversify and they have to let go for them to be attractive to a potential buyer. Do you have any advice for that type of situation? Yes, I do. I think I think it's important to, um, that, that there's always a glass ceiling that um, I think every business gets to. The, 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 first, the first obstacle is establishing a business. Um, and on the whole, a lot of businesses become a replacement for a job. And as long as a business stays a replacement for some job that the, the owner operator has had in the past, it really doesn't have a lot of value to anyone else. So it's to find a way through that glass ceiling and get some management structure in place, get some, get some, even if there's, there's some pain with that, there always is. Um, but get through that pain barrier, get a management team and a management structure in place and and just find a way of getting beyond that um, beyond that owner operator um, status. And there's lots of ways to do it. Um, it might be some kind of um, synergy with a, a, a supplier uh, or a customer or um, that it, it's, it's, it's kind of industry specific and it's actually even probably case specific. Uh, but it, it is an important step um, just to just to get away from that concept of being uh, of being a, a straightforward owner operator. There there are exceptions, I guess. You know, for somebody maybe like a, I don't know enough about the veterinary field to comment, but perhaps a a vet maybe setting up a, a small practice and establishing some regular customers has perhaps got some value there to some other vet, but. Um, that, that might be an example. It might not be a good example. I don't know enough about that that specific field, um, but um, but generally speaking, yeah, just just get beyond the uh, just get get beyond that startup stage as quickly as possible. And it's a, such a, such a common um, issue for like almost every you know segment. You know, you have these small business owners that just can't let go. And, yeah. But uh, yeah. Okay. Well. It's been fantastic uh, talking with you, Andrew. And uh, before we go, I have a set of questions. Are you familiar with Bernard uh, Pivot? No. He's a French talk show host. And um, there was a set of questions that he used to ask his guests. And it was sort of resurrected in an American, the actor's studio, uh, the presenter, would ask these questions. So uh, are you ready for a few uh, questions to, um, to answer? By the way. OK. What is your favorite word? Innovate, I guess. What is your least favorite word? It's not a word. It's got, it's got a high from the comfort zone. Comfort zone. <laughs> <laughs> what turns you on? Uh, all kinds of things. Um, invention and ideas. What sound do you love? 
Um, every sound that's associated with the very early mornings. So um, the the sound of of wind in the leaves, birds, every, everything early morning in nature. What sound do you hate? Um, mm, the, the, the phone ringing at <laughs> the phone ringing at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? Ah, uh, it's gonna. Do I say the Do I say the curse word? It's up to you. It's your yeah. curse word. It's It's got to be the 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 the, the one. Um, well, bastard. And there you be, go. And I use that because it's one that you can really get your back into. You can really get. <laughs> Effort behind that word. <laughs> I hear you. Good <laughs> word. What profession other than yours would you like to attempt? Um, other than my immediate profession, I guess um, corporate finance advice. What profession would you like not to participate in? Um, most things that I've already done simply because there's no excitement in them. And if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You're too early. Go back. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, Andrew, it's been a pleasure. And um, maybe we do this again sometime. Sounds good to me, Liam. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Yeah, and you.